Hey, what is going on, everybody? And welcome to the first episode of The Inforium, a show about productivity, uh, whatever Martin and I want to talk about, but not a show about the best way to cook boot leather. Well, I don't... Yeah, I, I just... Nothing about that is something that I can inform anyone on. No. No, I'm pretty... I'm pretty non-skilled um, at that particular type of food preparation. Yeah. So, you know, if we ever fall upon hard times, that's getting delegated to somebody else. Yeah, I feel so. like, yeah, that, that won't work well for us. <laughs> anyway, um, episode one. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Welcome to the first episode of a brand new podcast. Reborn. Which is uh, really just sort of a remix of the podcast we've been doing for a long time, the College Info Geek podcast. And if you are a previous listener of that show, this is going to be a fairly similar show. But we are changing the name because we basically want the freedom to talk about a wider web of topics yeah. without having to sort of justify, you know, an episode within the context of a college podcast. Plus, it's been a long time since I've been in college. Yeah, it was kind of arbitrarily limiting and no longer even reflective of either of us hosts who are both far beyond graduating at this point. Yep get married at some point whenever whenever all of the crazy virus stuff ends and i can actually plan a wedding I'm trying to buy <laughs> houses at some point in the in the future there's no college left in me to talk about <laughs> yeah but um you know as as we like to say and we even have like a shirt that says this we are never we never want to stop learning we never want to stop pushing forward and progressing so I think the ethos of the show that we've been running for seven years is still here. It's just no longer locked within this college label slash box. Yeah. Yeah. But I got some ideas for this show. I know you, you have a lot of ideas. Um, I want to use this sort of turning point as a way to maybe add in some things for the show that we hadn't done before, maybe add in a bit more structure. And I've got some ideas for for making the show a bit more listenable every t every single week instead of or maybe every other week instead of it being super topic reliant. Yeah. So yeah, I want to develop a show that has I don't know a bit more structure to it. And I think that's that's about it. Were you assuming that explaining the changeover uh, was going to take? I don't think explaining like the changeover hour? is going to take a while. It's uh. You know, because we're just discovering the changeover. We don't know what the future of the Emporium brings. Mm -hmm. It brings something, probably. But I can't even guarantee that. It brings a space where we get to talk about what we want to talk about. That's what I want with this show. Uh, my promise to the listener is that I'm not going to talk about stuff that is completely irrelevant to the overall idea of like self-improvement so oh, yeah we're it's not, it's not gonna, gonna be do... like what's my favorite kind of macaroni yes um I don't we're probably know. not gonna do a macaroni preferences podcast but if i want to do an episode on you know some of the ways that we're trying to grow our business i think some of the audience would find that helpful if we want to do an episode on like health or get back into the house buying series we were doing you know, I think all that's fair game. So it is a generalized self-improvement podcast. Yeah. And it, I, I feel like it kind of mirrors the direction I'm trying to take my YouTube channel as well. Where I don't want to be doing just productivity videos every week. I want to branch out a bit. So um, this going out on Monday, August 10th, if you haven't checked my YouTube channel lately, the video that I will have up um, very near the time this goes live is about making money online, which I've gotten a lot of questions about. Always felt kind of scared about doing that topic on my channel because I thought, you know, oh, I'm a productivity YouTuber. I want to I want to branch out from that a bit. So I'm going to start doing some experiments and seeing like what can I talk about on my channels that uh, kind of you know gets away from productivity just a bit but still brings in the audience yeah brings some sort of value and doesn't scare everyone off mm -hmm. it's where 
there's really no better time to experiment than right now at the start of a new podcast at the in the middle of we've got plenty of time to think because this year is still a mess and we yeah. can we can consider these things a little more thoroughly mm-hmm. absolutely uh so i think what we're going to do with this episode is we're going to get into the main topic you wanted to talk about um i also want to add in a couple of reader questions later on cool so we just got a little bit of you know a little bit of variety uh but you want to talk about something called goal webs which i don't know what a goal web is something is spiders like make some something about spider-man yeah all right yeah so tell, tell me what a goal web is so Basically, the reason I picked this topic for the first episode was because this is our first episode out from under the college name. And for me, the goal web is something that I came up with a while back to help me sort of sort out what I want from my post-college life. So I thought, that's a pretty cool transition. But okay. basically, it's my way of imitating how when you're going into – when you go to university to get a degree – you need to take different classes from different disciplines and you build up skills in each discipline separately. And the idea is that in the end, all of those things come together to mean something. Mm. So it's like a skill tree. Yeah. So basically I got out my whiteboard one day because I was kind of looking for some big life purpose. And I started writing down all of the stuff that I like to do. So I've got photography, pixel art, piano programming uh polyglotism i really i wanted to start everything with the same letter so that that's one's a little forced yeah i was gonna say it's they all start um, with b yeah and then um i had a couple more um play and prose so that i could shoehorn in exercise <laughs> under another word with p okay but how about physical exercise that doesn't it doesn't sound i guess neither does photography yeah. But I included some other things in there too. Um, but then what I did was I started drawing little lines out from each one. So photography, I've got uh, prints. That's something I could do. I could learn how to take portraits. I could try to get into photography exhibits. For pixel art, I could try to make cool sticker designs. I could do something that's in between photography and pixel art. I connected the two. I could make pixel landscapes, which I've tried a couple of times to merge pixel art with photography. With piano, I've got stuff like I can make albums. I could learn synthesizer stuff. I could write actual music that goes into the ultimate project. The Basically, in the end, after I had merged all of the different topics to each other in as many lines and formations as I could, so it's this giant web thing indicating how all my skills actually connect to each other for the most part. And I wanted to know, what's at the center of this web? What combines the most of my skills that seems like a really good final project sort of thing if I were to make mm -hmm. it school-related in metaphorical nature? And the answer is an indie game to, to make my own video game because that would take in my past writing experience that yeah. would obviously take in my experience playing uh tons of games and appreciating those it takes in my programming experience takes in my music experience pixel art is obvious and photography connects to pixel art because it teaches me a bit about composition of uh, a visual art form which could help sure. me make things like backgrounds and how do i want to present something or focus on it right Everything in the end connected to indie game, which is really cool for me because that is now a long-term goal that I didn't have at the time. And coincidentally, I had always wanted to do it as a kid. So maybe subconsciously, I accidentally kept walking toward all the skills that would eventually point me right back at it. Yeah. I think, I think that happens more often than people realize. They're like into something as a kid and then they realize years down the line that a lot of experiences have sort of contributed something to enabling them to do that thing they wanted to do yeah so do you have a game in mind or are you because i know you, you were developing ideas. some some smaller ones in pico 8 for a while yeah and that's one of the things uniting indie game and programming 
is learning Pico 8 and Unity, both of which mm. I've messed around with. I have a few ideas for games, but I haven't made it to the point where I'm actually... I don't know what like my big thing is yet. I'm still mm. working on the pixel art, and I want to learn a little bit more of the game development side for Pico 8 and Unity t- style programming. But it gave sort of all the things that I'm doing a little bit more of a purpose, a long-term purpose. And I think that's something that gets lost when you graduate sometimes. If you don't have some big old, I'm going to climb the career ladder thing in mind, sometimes it's just like, well, what am I, what am I aiming for? Without, yeah. without direction, I don't know how to move forward. Even if I don't end up at that goal eventually, I'd like to be moving forward. Yes. Yeah, it, it is something that we we kind of lose out on, or at least we lose out on somebody kind of laying that path in front of us. Yeah. Because when you're when you're in high school, you know they're they're going to ask you like, what do you want to go to college for? You go to college, you got to pick your major and all that. But for the most part, like you you make a couple of big decisions, and then it's like they've given you all the levels you have to traverse to get to the final boss essentially yeah and usually, usually you get that path yeah and a- after graduation like that that is kind of not there anymore unless you have chosen an extended path like that like you know going to law school or going to med school or some kind of grad school thing but for for many of us like we get a job and then there isn't some gigantic huge goal that is forcing you to learn a bunch of new things like you could say oh well you know the next goal is to buy a house or get married or something like that but i feel like those are those are goals that don't require you to learn a ton of skills and then bring them all together yeah those aren't like buy houses save money they're like side quests yeah in in a sense they're not connected to the to everything else Mm mm-hmm you know i guess if you have a huge a huge career goal then that may give you that but for people who don't, it may be interesting for them to go through this same kind of exercise. Or for people who have completed that, because that career path probably has an end goal for you in mind. If you're like, I really want to be the CEO of my own company and you get it. Now what? Yeah. Even even if you're tremendously successful, stagnation doesn't feel good. You'll probably still want to be trying something, even if it's a small goal. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I will say that the way I did this worked for me because I happen to do a whole lot of disparate things already. I, yeah. I just can't help myself. But you could also start with something in the center and break it down like it were a major and and figure out if I wanted to make an indie game, what separate skills would I need? The ability to write the game script, the ability to write or to make the art, the ability to write the music, the ability to program it. You could reverse engineer that if you have a big goal in mind. Yeah. But each one of these little, each one of these side projects has their own little projects and goals that I can work on, knowing that they will eventually build towards something bigger. I think if you combined just two, you could also get ideas for new challenges that would be difficult but probably doable for you. So what I'm thinking about right now is uh, a concept that I learned about in I think it was Cal Newport's book, "So Good They Can't Ignore You." He called the adjacent possible, and uh, in in science, the adjacent possible is kind of like the the immediate um, outskirt of our collective knowledge and our collective technological development. So the scientific community as a whole, if you picture a bubble of all of our knowledge, we're constantly reaching just outside of that bubble to expand our knowledge, to build new technologies, make new discoveries. And that's the adjacent possible. So when when we make a new discovery, it's almost never like one lone genius made this crazy quantum leap to an area that nobody else was even close to. It was more like scientific community as a whole was close to it. And we give the credit to one team, one company, one person who makes the discovery. But in many cases, like a lot of people are on the verge of doing it. I mean, a perfect example, um, Newton kind of invented calculus, but then like Leibniz also sort of invented calculus as well. And just, you know, Newton gets the credit. It was independent discovery uh, because, you know, we're all sort of together on the cusp of things. And you can think of that with 
your own skills and abilities and interests. So, you know, like in, in my case, I know that I can, I can play a couple of instruments and sing. I know how to make music and I have been doing YouTube videos for a long time. So a, a pretty good adjacent possible would be like making a music video. I've never yeah. done that before, but that is a goal and a project that neatly combines two things I already have a lot of experience doing. So I can identify that as like, that's that's probably a project that, number one, I'm going to find fun because I've been doing both of these things for so long. Number two, I haven't done it before. It's a little intimidating, but I know I have the skills that make me you know, just able to reach out and do something there. Yeah, and, and even if you don't like it, if you do that, you've probably learned something new about both of the separate skills mm -hmm. that still funnels right back in there. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess like if, if, if you meet people who understand what you can do, they may also be able to suggest things for you. Like uh, my, my friend Charles, who I met probably a month ago, uh, rides a motorcycle. You know, I, I'd like consider it in the past. And then he was telling me like, well, you know, you do all this downhill mountain biking. The amount of skill transfer there is incredible. Like it's going to be much easier for you to learn. So I took a class and I was like, oh yeah, I just kind of picked it up super easily because I've been riding a bike for so many years and riding a bike down like crazy fast downhill trails. So there's a lot there that sort of kind of pushed me into this, this new hobby very quickly and easily. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that people sometimes find it hard to find new hobbies. And I like this idea that an easy way to do it is simply take anything you already like and take a couple steps to the side of it and mm -hmm. just sort of see what it does. And a, and a lot of humanity's most creative things have been combinations of other things. Yeah, You, you don't necessarily need to be like the greatest pixel artist in the world to make a really good indie game, for example, mm -hmm. because what you need is the unique combination of what you're going to do with everything. So it's also maybe less intimidating in some cases than attempting to become the singular best master at one thing, which doesn't give you as quick of a reward track, which may demotivate you, especially if you're busy in life and you don't have... You don't want to give like 10,000 hours when you only have an hour or two every week. Yeah. You know, it's not going to feel rewarding quickly. So you're going to run out of steam. Mm -hmm. I think this concept of the goal web, it should also be a helpful way to visualize how people you look up to probably got to where they are. And when you think about it this way, you realize that people you look up to didn't have this straight linear path from, I don't know, like being five years old, I want to be this. And then they just do nothing but that and, and become the expert or famous person. Yeah. They are that's, today. that's gotta be super rare. It, it's super rare. Right? So if you think about, um, I, I guess one example that may fit that idea is like Tiger Woods, Tiger Woods, was golfing when he was like two years old and basically <laughs> just golfed and golfed and golfed until he became a pro. Um, but when you look at a lot of professional athletes, especially in disciplines outside of golf, which um, is, is kind of thought of as a, a kind learning environment where golf is, there are variables, but it's not like an incredibly dynamic variable driven sport. You know, it's kind of like you have, you want the most consistent swing every time. And your main variable is like the course you're on and the weather conditions of the day. Uh, but you get immediate feedback every time you take a swing. So it's like this very kind learning environment, not a ton of crazy changing variables. You don't have an opponent. You don't have a changing roster of opponents. You just have, you know, yourself and maybe a, some changing weather conditions. Yeah, that kind of a discipline lends itself to working within it and you know to the exclusion of all else and becoming a pro but with many other things um what research has found is like pro athletes played a ton of sports when they were kids and they got all this generalized experience and tried a bunch of things 
And when they kind of hit upon their sport, then that's when they go hard on it. But it's later on, maybe late teens, early 20s, and they've pulled all of this experience from all of these other sports they've played that kind of contribute to this overall general athleticism and this general level of coordination and this kind of big repertoire of skills uh, that makes them great. And I think that's kind of how pretty much anybody who's great at anything would would look back upon their career and, and see the development. Yeah, you just don't get to see all of the weird side things that may have accidentally led somewhere. Mm-hmm. So if a couple of years from now, you have like this awesome indie game out, and people are like, how'd you do that? Well, it's not, oh, I decided I want to be an indie game developer when I was eight years old, and then I did nothing but that, which I think people often... Uh, assume it's like no I was interested in photography and then I got interested in pixel art and I got interested in programming which started with web development and then moved into server side stuff which is kind of where I developed more of my you know actual programming skills uh, versus HTML like semantic yeah, markup language, language that kind of stuff and then I got into music totally separately and started learning composition skills because I wanted to write my own songs on the piano and it all came together in this weird, jumbled, wonderful mess. And I didn't really plan on it. And that should take the pressure off of people looking up to you who want to do the same thing. Because I know I've had several times in my life where I'm like, man, I really wish I would have started guitar earlier because now it's too late for me to be as good as that person. Man, I really wish I would have done this way earlier on. And now like, I don't stress about it because I realize people who are great maybe some of them started super early but a lot of them they have just as much of a jumbled history as i do but then they hit upon something and now they go hard on it yeah yeah and i just think that even even if i had known exactly that i was realistically going to be capable of making a video game at eight like i toyed with the idea like many young children who liked video games Mm -hmm. but i didn't like set out on a path because that would have been so overwhelming and the reward would be so slow that i probably would have given up or burned out and this is like i never really thought about it i just put out like uh i just put out a song this morning actually not not at all did i do that because it might teach me to do something for video games i i uniquely like each ingredient so i get Mm -hmm. to feel good in all of these separate disciplines rather than just like, Oh, I'm still not good enough for a video game. What a failure. <laughs> Dude, you just reminded me of something. Oh, I, I don't know how old I was when I did this, but I made a game in PowerPoint. In PowerPoint. <laughs> um, how how yeah, did was, you do this? It was like a choose your own adventure. Oh, okay. Which, that when makes when sense. I was growing up, I love the choose your own adventure books, Yeah. which for anybody who doesn't know, you'll read a page and then it'll be like, uh, you, there's a door on the left and a door on the right. If you want to pick the left one, go to page 92. If you want to go to the right one, go to page four. And so you're just constantly skipping around the book, which uh, probably seems ridiculous to people now who don't like read physical paper books. But yeah, you're just, you know, you're thumbing through the pages. And a lot of times the adventure ends very quickly. And, you know, it was great. I think there's like, you know, usually one kind of critical path, which is like the good ending. Yeah. But they were always fun. So I realized in PowerPoint, you can hyperlink from from different slides. So I would make a slide with like multiple choices. And then my brother and I, I don't know why we did this, but we we just always loved going and downloading sprites off the internet. So we'd get like sprites of all the little Zoid mechs from the anime Zoids, and we'd create like armies of them. So I used the, the Zoid mech sprites to create like bosses and enemies <laughs> in the different scenarios and just created like this weird web of slides that's great so yeah i guess i made a game in powerpoint did you ever present <laughs> that to to a class uh no no we just <laughs> it was just something sitting on our computer my brother and i made all, all sorts of like stu- uh, stupid crap on the computer just for fun yeah, maybe PowerPoint. I should have presented it PowerPoint to a class. is a toy. And, and the beauty is that anybody listening to this now now has much better immediate tools <laughs> than Microsoft PowerPoint to, to, to try That's out true. some stuff. I think you can also make games in Excel. 
I've never done it, but I think I've heard of people making I've, legit like, games. You can do itself. some some pretty good stuff in there. The programming capabilities are deeper yeah. than I would ever need to use. Well, it's I... like those graphing calculators where you could get like Tetris on the calculator. That's oh my gosh, you're right. Oh, dude, I had like so I never many had, games. I never had a calculator that did that, but I, I knew a bunch of people that were just playing games on them the whole Wait, time. Wait, did you you never had a graphing calculator? I didn't have one that was uh capable of that did you take um uh, calculus in high school yeah but i probably got the cheapest possible thing that could do it i'm trying to think of what calculator you could have used because i remember my mom being very angry going to the store with the school requirements list for i think it was like when i got into pre-calc she's like i have to buy an 84 dollar calculator oh yeah because I don't, I don't think there was Some an of those alternative. Were real expensive. It was, it was TI eighty three was like the base level one. Maybe there's another mm. one, and I remember the TI eighty three. Maybe I just the didn't regular, have the hookups. Which this is how ridiculous is it? And actually, I would be curious to know if, if anybody watch or listening to this podcast is still in school. Uh, let me know on Twitter, Tom. Frankly, do they still require Texas Instruments TI eighty three calculators? Because those things are so overpriced for what you get. It's the same calculator they've been using for like 30 years or more. Like a crappy monochrome screen that's like 32 by 24 pixels or something like that. And you you could have that on your cell phone for free. Yeah. And they, maybe they let people use their phones now. But I remember I still had to buy it in 2006 or 5. Uh, but I quickly discovered that there were games for it. And I loaded so many games on that thing. Somebody had made uh, a really good Mario on it. And actually, I remember uh, I remember kind of preferring the Mario that that person made for the calculator because the platforming physics didn't have the sliding. It was like the really precise platforming. You stop holding the mm. over button and it stops moving. Uh, so I just, I don't know, I would sit in math class playing Mario on my calculator. <laughs> And thus, a generation of students did not learn math. Hey, I learned math. But that's cool. I got my homework done. I just also played Mario on my yeah. calculator in class. Hey, I got I got a lot of experience learning how to load those games on my calculator, sometimes debug them. It's like you would have to go into the basic code sometimes. Well, no, no judgment here. I was a things. terrible student in high school. Just a horrendous student. <laughs> I was I was a decent student who was always doing things last minute. I was just a horrendous student. <laughs> the classes were boring. If it wasn't challenging, I didn't care to learn it. So I may have failed a class every year until my senior year of high school when I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to graduate. I should probably like try for three seconds. Well, that's the thing. Like, like the, the school system we set up is not built to serve every student well and I, I don't know if we can ever create a society-wide educational system that does serve every student well but the one we have right now certainly doesn't yeah i just didn't care yeah you know and i think like if i didn't have so much pressure on me specifically from my parents i may not have cared either but i when i was growing up I was expected to get like all A's and like, I would be grounded sometimes if I would, if I didn't get all yeah. A's, well, that's... like it was, it was like that kind of pressure from my parents. Um, you know, and I was also very future minded. So everyone telling you know, all the high school counselors being like, if you don't get good grades, you're not going to get into a good school. You're not going to get scholarships. And my parents were like, we can't afford to pay for your school. So you better get scholarships. I had a lot of the, what's the word for it? Like external, pressure and mm. uh you know desire to win external rewards but just like you like many of the classes i didn't care about yeah well i also i got failed out of a speech class and i couldn't go back to it because i gave a speech nervously it seems no, yeah, this counterintuitive is the thing it was this a little the... egregious i would say yeah but every time you tell me the story i'm i'm very angry for you I'm, I'm very angry. I did really well in the next speech class. Uh, the short version for all of you listeners is that I skipped the first few speeches because I was too nervous. 
The teacher said I had one last chance. I tried really hard, practiced my next speech a thousand times, and went up to the class and presented how to juggle. But I gave it a little robotically, got nervous, and at the end of it said, that's it, and then sat back down. She failed me for this and kicked me out of the class forever because I was nervous in a speech class. I thought that's what she's supposed to be teaching me. First yeah, of all, this is what we call it seems obvious that a kid a would be nervous. Bad, uh, a very bad teaching decision. I mean, why would I? I, oh, I memorized everything, but it doesn't matter because the next year was way better. I failed a ton of stuff like that, and then it all worked out because eventually I just got got through it. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, that story makes me mad every time I remember it just because I was like a teenager. Which Which teenager is automatically fantastic at giving speeches it seems obvious almost no one i remember yeah. having to give speeches in speech class in high school it was terrifying i mean you're already in high school so everything is terrifying yeah you're like oh if i sneeze the wrong way all the popular kids are gonna think i'm the biggest loser in the entire school and i will never get a date and my life will be over because high school is stupid and you have zero self-confidence at least yeah. I didn't. <laughs> anyway, that's that's sort of a tangent, but man, it's a tangent that makes me mad. Right? Like, if you're a teacher and you want to instill the joy of learning into your students and you want to help them get over their failures, get over their nerves, get over nervousness, all that kind of stuff, what do you not want to do? Let's think here. You don't want to uh, watch them give this, like, you know, very obviously very difficult attempt after you said this is their last chance and then reward yeah, them no, by being like, that's not no, good enough. You're kicked no, out. No pressure. Like, <laughs> come on. I don't know. It makes me so angry. I, yeah, actually, you know what? It makes me pissed off. That's not enough of a swear word to put explicit on this podcast. Oh no. <laughs> we're growing up I was up starting now. to think like, like we're changing the podcast name. Can I, can I do swears now? I don't know. You just did one in the last podcast. That was an accident. Not even thinking about it. I was that was not on purpose. <laughs> I probably won't. I don't. I don't want to have to slap explicit language on this podcast that, for no reason. Just imagine them wherever you'd like to hear them. Yeah, that's to, to choose your choose your own adventure podcast. Imagine yeah. some swear words just in between every other word yeah, that you just actually do hear. It, do what you want. This is your universe to imagine. <laughs> This week's episode of our show is brought to you by our friends over at Skillshare, which is an online learning library that can help you learn skills in a ton of different topic areas, ranging from productivity to business and marketing to video editing, motion graphics, illustration, photography, all kinds of different areas that can help to uh, boost your creative skills and also your career prospects. I have a couple of classes on Skillshare, one about building a productivity system and one about building stronger habits. So if you're trying to kind of get back on the horse with your productivity systems, those classes may be helpful to you. And there's also a class that I want to promo this week about After Effects animation. I'm going to promo this class because uh, as I record this, I am in the middle of a very after Effects heavy edit for a video going up on my channel. And I've actually learned a couple of new After Effects techniques in the creation of this video, which have made the edit a lot easier. But the class that I want to point out is a Jake Bartlett's class, Animating with Ease in After Effects. So if you're somebody who's wanted to get into motion design or you make videos and you sometimes bring in graphics, one of the fundamental concepts you wanna learn about animation is easing. So if you think about motion, right, I could move my hand across the screen, and if it was a linear, uh, linear speed, then it is going to keep its uh, keep like a specific amount of speed the entire time, which isn't really how things move in real life. In real life, there's like acceleration, there's deceleration, there's also uh, deformity, like bouncing and stretching. So if you really get into animation, you learn those things. But easing is kind of one of those fundamental concepts you want to learn. You know, does it start out slow and get fast? Does it start out fast and get slow? And Jake Bartlett's Animating with Ease course in Skillshare is a great way to learn how to actually do those kind of animations in After Effects, which is going to improve the quality of any kind of video content you're making. So one of the greatest things about Skillshare is, number one, it's really affordable, less than 10 bucks a month. And number two, if you want to give it a try, you don't even have to pay anything for the first two months if you go over to Skillshare.com geek and sign up. Because when you do that, you're going to get yourself a two-month unlimited 
free trial. So if you're ambitious and you've got some time, you could learn a lot on Skillshare in those first two months. Again, it's an unlimited free trial. Take my courses, take Jake's course, take a ton of the After Effects courses, load up your brain with tons of knowledge while you're trying it out. And then after that, again, it's really affordable, less than 10 bucks a month. So it's a great service to stick with. And I'm going to have more courses coming on Skillshare in the near future. So you may want to stay subscribed for that reason. So once again, if you want to start improving your skills in all these areas, head over to Skillshare.com slash geek and sign up to get that two month free trial. Big thanks to Skillshare as always for supporting our show and sponsoring this episode. And another thanks goes out to our second sponsor this week, which is Hover. So one thing that I talk about a lot on this podcast and on our previous podcast, the College Info Geek podcast, is that if you want to be successful in today's economy, you need to have an online presence, a personal website, a portfolio, if you do any kind of creative work that you can easily show off, some kind of online presence where people can find you, connect with you, and potentially work with you. That could be, you know, getting a job. That could be, if you're a freelancer, landing clients. That could be building relationships with other people. In fact, Martin, you once made a website that wasn't just a personal website. It was a website that was like specifically trying to get a job at, a, at, a, at one company. Yep. Which was pretty sweet. Only and company that, I applied to and it paid off. That's true. Yeah. It was like, I want to fly with hippos.com uh, applying to a company called Flying Hippo. And then we kind of like made it all hippo themed and had uh, explanations of your skills and why you wanted to work there. And they found that really impressive. But, you know, it's a very specific example. I think what you want to start with is a personal website like mine, thomasjfrank.com, where, again, people can see your work and connect with you. And if you want to build a website like that, the first thing you need is a domain name, which you should go get over at Hover. Hover is the best place on the Internet to get domains. They have a frictionless, easy, and quick process for checking out and they have over 400 different domain extensions. So you can get a .com, you can get a .me, those are the classics, everyone knows those. But if you want to stand out a bit, you could also get something a little bit funkier. I've got thomasjfrank.com, but I've also got thomas.lol. You can go to that if you want to see what is there. I've got that at Hover though, because again, there were no annoying pop-ups, no annoying upsells. I just got my domain and it was great. Plus, once you have your domain, you can also get a professional looking email address like thomas at thomasjfrank.com, which is a bit more professional looking than a Gmail or a Yahoo or God forbid, a, a Hotmail. <laughs> Uh, or one of those like ISP ones, like at, at Mediacom or at Net Zero, those kind of things. I saw one of those the other day, actually. Uh, and they also have a feature called Connect. So if you want to hook that domain up to a website builder or even like an online marketplace store builder, you can easily do that from Hover's uh, control panel. And one thing I'll note here is even if you're maybe you're in high school, maybe you're in college, if you're not ready to build a website for yourself yet, you want to get your domain because at any time, anybody could buy that domain and then you don't have the option of getting it. And you know, something that frustrates me on a daily basis is I can't get thomasfrank.com. Whoever got it, I think they got it back in like 1998 when I was seven years old or something like that. Uh, so I never really had a chance, but um, you know, every, every day I wish, like, man, I wish I could have that domain. And you don't want to feel like that with your own domain, whether it's your name or whether it's like a really cool business idea you have, get that domain, just have it sitting there ready for when you want to build that thing. So if you're ready to get the domain, go over to hover.com slash CIG, that's H-O-V-E-R.com slash CIG to get 10% off your first purchase and to support this show. Once again, hover.com slash CIG and big thanks to Hover for sponsoring this episode and supporting our show, which we are now going to get back into. Um, getting back to the idea of goal webs, um, I did a talk at a school, I think it was like Mount Vernon in Iowa or something like that, where they wanted me to talk about careers. So I think that's all they asked for is like, talk about careers to our sophomore class. So <laughs> that's, that's it. Just I did an careers. exercise where I drew out my career path because I wanted to see like how weird and messy it was. So I was drawing it out. I was like, well, I started out wanting to be a systems admin going to school for management information systems, learning about, uh, you know, anything from like web development to uh, computer networking to all that kind of stuff. But there were all these little things I did. Like I joined this club in high school where I had to speak publicly to like 500 students because I was on the officer board. And I was like, well, there's something that kind of relates to what I'm doing now. And then 
I think it was like my junior year, I had given a speech for this program called uh, Ignite, where you give five minute speeches. And I wanted to see the video of my speech. And they said, hey, we're gonna have the videos and the speeches online. And they were taking forever. So I emailed the guy who had ran the event. I said, hey, I don't know how to edit video, but if you're behind those videos and you want some help, like I would be willing to learn and edit the videos for you. And they said, well, we, we actually just finished those. They're going up next week. But funny you ask, we need a video editor for this other project. And if you want to do it, like we'll pay eight bucks an hour and we'll teach you how to do it. So I was like, oh, hey, I learned how to edit video from that. And then I started the blog and there's all of these little things uh, in the course of running the blog that have helped with my current job now from writing things to doing the podcast, doing uh, article narration sometimes. And I got to the point where I was like, oh, okay, YouTuber, it's not something I set out to be, but there's like all these little things I did with no intention of being a YouTuber that kind of contributed. Yeah. Which is pretty interesting. So I, w I would advocate that everyone do this like map out not just like the critical career path but like also the side projects and the offshoots and just kind of see if you can see the connections between little projects you've done for fun or whatever and what you're doing now yeah. see if it contributed and it's cool because you probably wouldn't have guessed back then that you'd be doing youtube videos yeah. No, dude, I not thought Not the least be in the of basement. which was we couldn't have possibly imagined a lot of aspects of what we're doing right now because it simply wasn't there. But still, this stuff only came into focus later. So if you were preemptively mapping out all of this stuff, you might spot a potential connection that could end up being your cool career path that you just didn't know about yet. That's true. Like you, like you did, like game development. Yeah, I would, I would like to seriously consider that now. And before, I had kind of just throwing it away, not realizing I was separately learning most of the things involved. Mm -hmm. So I guess, yeah, you could do this with a retroactive view, or you could do it with a proactive view with the goal of identifying potential projects that you could use that combine all of your skills, or at least combine a couple of them. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. So while we're figuring out the structure of this podcast, maybe it's going to be a little bit messy, but that's fine. It'll probably be a little bit messy for a little bit. I'm, I'm cool with things being messy. Yeah, uh, okay. I do want to get into a couple of listener questions before we wrap this episode up. Uh, so the first one, and I think this is going to be like a bit of a discussion because it's I don't think the answer is cut and dry, but somebody on Twitter this morning asked me, uh, what, what's better, weekly planned major improvements in your productivity versus daily minor improvements in your productivity? What is... Okay, what's a what's a minor versus major? I know, I'm trying to come up with some examples here. So yeah, I'm trying to interpret this question, and the immediate thought for me is um, like weekly reviews, especially on you know, how well your systems are working versus like daily reviews and trying to make small improvements every single day. Well, I mean, my I still use my goal notebook system that uses a two week cyclical. That's two weeks review. Therefore, I must view that those are pretty useful because on day-to-day -day changes i might lose track of what good they're bringing or they'll mm. bring such small amounts of good that i don't feel good about it so it doesn't really matter if i was a little more effective but if i yeah. set up a bigger improvement or a small time goal for the next two weeks i feel good about it maybe it's not mathematically accurate in the long term but i like to prioritize the feeling like I actually succeeded at something. So I need a little yeah. bit bigger of a goal than just a daily, a small daily thing. I mean, I tend to agree with you. The underlying math behind all of this is so buried in the fabric of the universe that it's not worth talking about you know, whether it's yeah, I don't, have, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have time to study all the potential me's to see what they might accomplish. That's true. Yeah. Can we, can we quantify the decrease in my energy levels because of the food I ate for breakfast today versus yesterday. And how did that contribute to my productivity? Like, I, I don't want to get too detailed here. Uh, but I agree with your idea because here's the thing. Like if you're a scientist and you're building an experiment or if you're uh, a marketer and you make, like, say we make a change on the college of Geek website and we want to track, you know, 
let's just say we we replace the button on the home page that says sign up for our email list with an actual email field. Yeah. And we want to know does that increase email signups? Well, we need to let it sit there for probably a few weeks. Oh yeah. Otherwise, yeah, the data we get is not going to there's not going to be enough. So we're not going to get a statistically significant answer. We could change it one day and then change it back the next day. But all right, for one day, we got fewer email signups than than yesterday when we had the button. Clearly a terrible idea. We got to go back. That's just not how things work because everything, there's all kinds of variables. So the smaller your time scale, the more variables there are at play that could have influenced things. You need to widen your time scale so you can isolate the variable that you're trying to learn about. And I think it's the same with self-improvement and productivity. Like if you're wanting to make a change in the system, you should make that change and then execute on it for a week or in your case, two weeks, then do your, do your, your review. Yeah. That, that's your actually a really review. good point. Just, yeah, you never know. Maybe I didn't sleep well last night. That doesn't mean that the ideas that I had to try today were bad. And mm -hmm. yeah, like you, that makes a lot of sense. You need a couple weeks of data to figure it out. Otherwise it's just a bad Tuesday. Yes. Uh, no, we can, we can do daily minor improvements, especially if you catch yourself like, okay, something went wrong yesterday. Can I avoid that today? You know, yeah. in, in my case, it's probably don't go to the store and buy a pint of ice cream because it will be gone the next day. So yeah, right, there, daily there are some minor things that would work don't for them. Buy. You probably don't need two weeks of buying a pint of ice cream every day to determine whether exactly. that's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be, you know, scenarios where a smaller time scale works but for for most things and i think to get to the heart of this person's question i think weekly is like probably like the the most frequent interval for really examining your systems because if you're spending all your time trying to examine and tweak your systems how much time do you have left over for actual work yeah and when the system is new you're watching yourself you're paying Ooh. attention so your data is flawed because if, if I'm like, let's see if I could work 10 hours every day, I bet you I succeed for a first few days because I've got that energy of like, I don't want to fail. That was my challenge, but yeah. it'll take a little bit to find out will, would I naturally do that? Is that sustainable? Get past mm -hmm. the excitement of the new system first. And you need a little bit of time for that. Yeah. There's that, uh, what is it? The Hawthorne effect? I think. Yeah. I know there's Where a name for people, it. I just people who know, they're under observation, change their behavior. There was also some study I read a long time ago, uh, apparently like men who know, I, I assume straight men, but like men who know they're being watched by a woman will like change the way they walk. Ooh, that's like a little more swagger to it. Do like a little tropical bird dance. Exactly. Obviously. Yeah. You got to do your tropical yeah, like bird you, dance. You know you're being watched even if you're watching yourself. If you set up a new budget, you'll stick to it for the first few days, but you don't know if it's too harsh until later. Yeah. So, yeah, give yourself some time to gather data and observe what happened over, you know, at least a week. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then we're going to get into the other question is uh, something that I, I wasn't really asked this on Twitter, but um, there was a discussion that happened on Twitter and I was mentioned so this person was curious about like how much you need to pay for good lighting in YouTube videos. So kind of a YouTube question. Uh, and they were convinced that they had to pay more than $200 for good lights. Well, number one, I will submit that the lighting on you right now is not that bad. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I've like, just got, I've just got good window positioning, I guess. Yeah. You have a nice amount of contrast and it may look different on your iPhone because I can only see you through the webcam. But it's like there's a nice contrast. You know, you could probably like stand to separate yourself in the background a little bit because your walls are cream colored. But, you know, it's not bad. And uh, that's something I didn't even mention when I tweeted these people. Like, you don't have to pay anything for yeah, lights. Yeah, there's a pretty good light out there. It's pretty the big. Sun. Turns out that's free. Um, but what I told them is I got to, I think, my first 100,000 subscribers on YouTube using these DIY lights I cobbled together from stuff I found at Home Depot. You can get, I think they're just called clamp lights. It's like a metal clamp with like a circular uh, light fixture that you can screw a regular light bulb into. You can get those for, I think they're $8. And 
and then they clamp onto anything. Are those so the you ones you even... set up? You like set on fire by trying to put wax paper no. or something in front of it? Those were the ones I got after I accidentally started. Almost <laughs> okay, so this almost. is the improved version. Yes. Okay. So I didn't know anything when I was starting YouTube, right? Except for I thought to like my my conception of a movie set. I'm like, well, lights on movie sets, like it's there's a light, but then there's a big like softbox. Well, I didn't know how those softboxes were made, so I'm like, I better, I'm just gonna DIY it. And I go to Target and I find a hamper, and it's a hamper that's like made of cardboard, and then there's some sort of fabric stretched over the cardboard to make it look a little fancier. So I buy that, and then I go to Home Depot and I buy a halogen shop light. You know, I don't know anything about light types yet, so I don't know how much heat this thing is gonna put out. I cut a hole in the bottom of the hamper and I stick it onto the halogen shop light to create my soft box, duct tape it there. And then I put, I think it was a white bed sheet over the front to create diffusion. And I start filming and then I start to smell smoke <laughs> and realize, oh, that halogen shop light gets really, really hot. And the fabric hamper is made of fabric and cardboard both of which are flammable and the fabric is like some come like some kind of plastic recycled fabric so it's also melting <laughs> it was a bad thing all around so yeah almost almost set my apartment on fire which was also your apartment sorry martin well that was and sucked. then my friend andrew peters uh who lives in des moines we used to hang out all the time in des moines he's like dude wistia the web host or the video hosting company, they have this whole series of videos that teach you how to do video. And they have one on how to build your own DIY lights for super cheap. And what they said is you, know, you get those clamp lights, you get LED light bulbs, so they don't put out a lot of heat. And then for diffusion, all you need is you can you could get like diffusion paper from photo stores, or you could just put wax paper in front. So mm -hmm. I think it was like my first 100,000 subscribers were just those clamp lights, LED bulbs, and two layers of wax paper in front of the bulbs for diffusion. That was it. So just and at, at first that, I like had 20, 30 bucks or something. Yeah, probably it was eight dollars for the clamp lights and then the LED bulbs. I think back then they were kind of newer, so they were maybe like ten bucks a bulb. Now they're so cheap. They're so cheap. Um, you'd want to get like a nice color temperature, maybe daylight, and then get like you if you wanted to do background lighting, you could do twenty seven hundred K bulbs for the backgrounds. So it's like nice and warm in the background. Uh, and I didn't even have light stands at first. I just clamped them to my loft bed, and my bookshelf, you know, but if you want light stands, you can get those for pretty cheap too. And then, uh, later on, I think like around a hundred thousand, I found it was like a $70 kit. I think it was like the limo studio kit from Amazon. They don't have it anymore, but there's one that's basically exactly the same. So just put like video light kit. It was like 70 bucks. And I used that until probably probably a million and a half subscribers yeah there's something so. delightfully college about that just cobbling together a bunch of stuff i think yeah. a lot of that mindset we gotta not throw it away the second second we graduate because that's still really useful and then we just tack on the assumption that we need to get the super legit versions of everything mm -hmm. suddenly we're like one person trying to rent out a two bedroom apartment because it seems more adult with a giant bed and a whole bunch of stuff. And you just bring in all these complications, but your solution for quite a while was basically just a dorm room level solution. And it, yeah. it was fine. And exactly. It didn't stop being fine. Mm -hmm. So point number one, if you want to start a YouTube channel, you can do it probably for a lot less money than you think you can or that you think you need. And sometimes I've seen people, they will use low production budget to their advantage. There's this one guy, I cannot remember his name right now, but he does art tutorials on YouTube. Sometimes he's on camera. And he has like this sort of like Southern persona he has going on. So he like wears American flag sunglasses and a trucker hat. And then half the time he is speaking into a loft mic, but he doesn't have it on his shirt. He's got it scotch taped to the tip of a combat knife naturally so it's just speaking into a combat knife and it's hilarious uh you know like on youtube crappy production value you can kind of spin that to be funny 
So, but like, we, we'll do it sometimes. We'll like let the mic get into the shot on accident sometimes. Be like, oops. <laughs> I don't know. It's funny. So, you know, don't worry about looking super professional because what you really need to do is make interesting content. And then if, if anything on the technical side matters, it's good sound. Yeah. People will forgive subpar video quality all day long. If you want an example, this podcast, like we used to be on a set and we used to, I used to spend, you know, probably like half an hour setting up the lights and getting it looking just <laughs> perfect for us to sit at yeah. this table and talk together. And then the Rona hit. And now we are remote. And for a while, I was like insistent upon using my crazy camera that I was using when we were on the set to film my side. But you didn't have a crazy camera. No, I'm just so using my like, phone. And now we're, you know what? We just both use our phones. I, and it, the funny thing is it makes it more consistent looking because at least like we're both filming with the same camera. Yeah. And no one's complained and there hasn't been a dip in podcast downloads or views. It's fine. But if we were to switch these microphones out for terrible microphones, or if I had this microphone over at the end of the room, there was all this reverb and echo and it didn't sound nice, then people would complain. Yeah. If we didn't treat the audio once and let it like pop over the, I don't remember the name right now but if we let it do some crackles and pops at the high ends oh, of peaking. the sound yeah that's what it is peaking mm -hmm. i haven't had to do that in a bit but if we let that happen just a few times suddenly this is unlistenable and it yep. becomes garbage yeah almost nothing is unpleasant or painful to watch with maybe the exception of like I, I don't know, like somebody getting eye surgery or well, that's you know, like, like a whole different things. reason. The Porygon episode, yes, yeah, but but we're not gonna do that on the podcast. So we're probably good. Yeah, but like you know, if it's just oh, the lighting's not that good. Like okay, you could probably do it better. And a lot of that is just learning the set composition. Like if you've got a window, position your camera over near the window and then sit opposite the window to light your face instead of sitting with the window behind you just blowing out the scene and leaving your face in shadow like you know those are some things you can learn but for the most part like make it look decent and make it sound good what you can do by getting um i i love the atr 2100 mic it's like 75 bucks it plugs into your computer via usb you don't even need a recorder and you could just you could hold it yeah Pretty Actually, sure that's you know, the one I'm using right now. When I, yeah, it's the one you're using right now. Um, it's funny, like when I was starting as a YouTuber, I'm like, oh, I have to make sure that mic is out of frame because that's what a professional YouTuber does. They keep the mic out of frame. And now I've been watching this channel, Donut Media, and they do videos about cars. They have like 4 million subscribers. And half their videos, the guy is just, he's got a microphone and he just talks into it. And he like, he uses it as a prop. He just, like uses it to be more animated. So... You know, there, there's no rules. Just do it. Just do yeah, your thing, meet, man. Meet, meet the bare minimum of sound and, the, and mm -hmm. then appreciate that literally everything else people will probably forgive you for. But simultaneously, the differences, if you start improving the lighting over time, will be noticeable. So you're probably going to get credit for that, but you sure. won't get, you're not going to be ruined for not doing it. It's only positives. That's true. If I let my quality go down, then people might point that out. But that's true. You it, probably shouldn't they go also, backwards. They point they point it out when it goes up. So there, there is merit in giving people a baseline to compare to, because then when you exceed that baseline, they're like, hey, you exceeded my expectations. Yeah. And if there's one overarching philosophy that I try to live by when it comes to creating content and running my business, it's exceed people's expectations which you do in two ways. Number one, you don't set their expectations incredibly high before you deliver something. And then two, you deliver something that's great. Yeah. And of course, like, it's, over -deliver. it's hard to keep that up forever because their expectations shift as you give them more and more great things, which can, you know, create mounting pressure. Um, but it's a good thing to keep in mind. You know, how can you over deliver? And hopefully we over deliver with this podcast. Hopefully. I, I like Boom. to set the expectations as low as possible. So that if we just maintain a conversation, we've exceeded that baseline. Does that mean I should put a little thing at the beginning of this episode? Like, hey, guys, just so you know, this episode is total crap. 
Uh, yeah, every we gotta barely like, worth listening. We to. gotta like fish for compliments at the beginning of every video in order to set their. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that. Guys, I don't think this, this is very good. I'm feeling uh, bad about myself today. I don't. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to do this. I've changed my mind. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that, I think that's gonna do it for the first episode of the Inforium. Uh, I think it's a pretty good one. And what are we doing for URLs? Theinforium.com slash one. Yeah, we can do that. You know, not even set up yet. I'll figure it out. Cool. You can slash, set it up. We'll probably do a slash one. I don't see myself doing slash zero zero one. That seems obnoxious. Not. I'm just not going to type zero. Just the inforium.com slash one. Just which, whatever number. That'll of get the you there. It is. It's it's that theinforium.com, and for anybody who needs a spelling, it's in inforium i n f o r i u m, eight letters. Yep. It's easy. Inforium.com slash one. Uh, yeah. So next week, we'll probably have more reader questions, maybe some other kind of cool segment. But if you have reader questions, send them over to us either on Twitter or Instagram or the YouTube version of this podcast. Those are probably the easiest ways to send questions over. So uh, I'm Tom Frankly on Instagram and Twitter. And then you are which one? Uh, that's a uh, Yo Martholomew. Spelled like Bartholomew, but with an M yeah. on both Instagram and Twitter. Although, in all fairness, if you look at my Twitter and it doesn't look like I post much, that's because I, I only recently started using it. But I'll still I'll still see what you say, probably. Yeah, we like we log in and check. Yeah, I'll, so, I'll see questions, even if it looks like I haven't cared about a lot. Send us questions. And they don't have to be about general productivity. Like, we're going to branch out on this show. I fully intend to do a video talking about, like, our server set up at some point or, or podcast. yeah like here's our password the ip address yeah. to our that yeah. kind of that kind of an episode we can well do that. sometimes you gotta just inject a little bit of challenge into your life and i need, I need the adrenaline just... of knowing that our business is being <laughs> hacked i need that rush to feel alive but no like i you know i want to talk i like doing youtube stuff i like setting up infrastructure for editing videos more efficiently and that kind of stuff like i want to talk about that so we'll probably do an episode at some point about how tony and i have our server set up hey maybe tony could be on that episode maybe indeed it's a brand new podcast we do whatever we want that's true because we guests yeah, back on maybe. we can do what we want we do whatever we want uh speaking of doing whatever you want this is the end of the podcast so go do whatever you want but one thing you could do if you wanted to is go over to Apple podcasts and give this podcast a rating and review. If you enjoy it. I mean, if you don't enjoy it, you could also do that, but I'm not going to like encourage you to go send like a two star review. Yeah, that, that wouldn't make sense. That's just like, uh, well, come on, man. Come on. If you don't have something nice to say, don't say it at all. My dad told me that. Or maybe truly, like truly teacher. timeless wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I was told like eight years ago that that helps with the Apple podcast algorithm. I don't know if it's true do, anymore. Do things change in eight years? I don't know. Sometimes they definitely they do. do. Well, it used to be able to get on this new and noteworthy thing. No, like no matter what, if you, if you watched the podcast, it was in new and noteworthy. As long as you had art. Uh, now, it's like, nah. now it's, well, now there are too many people. They just have to change it like every five minutes. Yeah. So actually when, when people say like, Hey, the best thing you could do is start a podcast for building your online business. I'm like, is it though? Because it, as I see it, a podcast is one of the hardest things to market when it comes to I don't know how content. people find this podcast, if not through college info geek, previous podcast or your videos. I feel like yeah. the podcast itself, I don't, do people just find us like browsing through podcasts? Well, I've got, Somebody I've got, probably uh, does, but I don't know how they find us. I've got a autoresponder in the in the newsletter oh, yeah. that tells That's people true. about the podcast. Though I may have changed that actually, I may have taken that down and replaced it with a Nebula thing. Possibly. Um, there's also our best podcast article on CIG that like we're in there because you know you got to throw some cheeky self promotion in your best of list. Obviously, we don't list ourselves as the best podcast though. It's like it's in the middle. We're all and right. You know what? I, I probably we would probably do better if I just was like that guy and put us at the top. <laughs> yeah. 
Just put trending Maybe. podcasts and then list I should, whatever I should put you us want. at the top be like, this isn't the best podcast, but it is our podcast. If you're curious, check it out. Yeah, I could do that. I'm sure I could find like a humble, if not a braggy, a humble braggy way to put us at the top of that article. Yeah. I don't think we're the best, but you probably will. (laughs) There we go. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. I'm just saying that you're probably going to think it. Yeah, I've been hearing it, though. So, Yeah. Uh, And then maybe people find us through YouTube. But I don't know. My only argument here is, like, if you have no other platforms, if you're not blogging, YouTube, videoing, whatever, like, you start a podcast, how do you get that out? Because it's like an hour-long audio file. It's not optimized for sharing. People share TikToks and GIFs and videos and quotes, but they don't share podcast episodes. Yeah. So, Um, you know, it's going to change a little bit going forward because there are companies building tools where you can share like a tiny snippet from a podcast and social media, things like that. But I I don't know. I feel like... But it, it was very good for building speaking abilities and confidence, interview skills. So there are reasons to do it. I'm just not sure if it is like the smartest type of content to create for the intention of building a business online. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Uh, before I go off on a tangent that makes this yeah, an the entire ta- The tangents are staying in this episode. podcast, just, <laughs> just so you all know. Well, yeah, like we could have made it a podcast with like a oh, definite no, I started, title. I started a tangent about tangents. <laughs> Backspace. This is a sine cosine tangent. Backspace. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's going to be it. So once again, in theinforium.com slash one, if you want to get show notes for this episode, we're still doing show notes and uh, just theinforium.com for all of the ways to subscribe to this podcast we are still on spotify uh, apple podcasts google podcasts stitcher pocket casts all the things and we made sure that the art looks very similar yeah except for now we're 2d i've always wanted to and it says 2D. the emporium well now you can be you always wanted to be illustrated now you can be luckily your fiance is good at illustrating so. all right That is going to be it for this podcast. We will see you in the next one. Bye.